On the afternoon of the 14th of September 1942, German infantry reached the shoreline of the Volga inside the city of Stalingrad. There, they proceeded to set up anti-tank guns and fortify their positions in the Gosbank, the House of Specialists, and other buildings nearby. They then sank two Soviet barges and a ferry crossing the Volga, as around 60 men from Petrakov's NKVD unit held on desperately to the bank. These policemen were the last skirmish line stopping the Germans from dipping their toes in the Volga, and their ammunition was quickly running out. Another group of NKVD troops from 62nd Army's staff fought their way north and reached Petrakov's men. Ivan Yerfeyev described what happened. It was a scene of indescribable chaos. Everything was burning, everybody was shouting and screaming. German planes were attacking in relays, coming down really low, first machine gunning and then bombing. The harbour was in flames and the heat reached such intensity that the Katusha rockets, unloaded and stacked by the quayside, suddenly ignited. They were all flying out of their boxes, exploding everywhere like ghastly fireworks. We were desperately running about, trying to separate the ammunition boxes, with German snipers picking us off all the time. By 1800 hours, the men of the tankless 6th Tank Brigade were fighting German submachine gunners near Station No. 1. And other units were in a terrible state too. The 1315th Rifle Regiment of the 399th Rifle Division was down to just 36 men. It was clear that, if the Soviets didn't get reinforcements, they were going to lose the centre of the city. But that afternoon, General Alexandra Ilyich Radimsev stumbled into Chirikov's command post. Radimsev had just crossed the Volga, his uniform covered in dust and mud, having repeatedly thrown himself to the ground to avoid German bombs. He was a veteran of the Red Army, having already earned the title of Hero of the Soviet Union during the Spanish Civil War. More importantly, he was the commander of the 13th Guards Rifle Division, which had just arrived on the eastern bank of the Volga. This was the fourth time that 13th Guards Rifle Division had been reformed, having originally started out as the 87th Rifle Division, which was destroyed, reformed, then converted into the 13th Guards Rifle Division. 13th Guards then got crushed again during the opening stages of Foul Blau, and had just 33 men left on the 15th of July 1942. It was then evacuated to the Urals for rest and refitting before reappearing again on the 14th of September 1942. The division now had between 9,500 and 10,000 men. And this is where we come to one of the great myths about the Battle of Stalingrad. The one rifle per two soldiers myth. Portrayed in films like Enemy at the Gates, but also in a lot of the older books like Beaver's Popular Stalingrad or Craig's Enemy at the Gates, it has been suggested that the 13th Guards Rifle Division was without its full complement of rifles when it entered Stalingrad. It thus sent its soldiers charging into combat in unarmed waves, with commissars shooting them in the back if they dared to retreat. <laughs> Since a lot of people in the West subscribe to the idea portrayed within the film or the books, it's worth addressing it and the one rifle per two soldiers thing once and for all. In this film, an entertaining film, I'll give it that, Vasily Zaitsev, who wasn't even a member of the 13th Guards Rifle Division, which was the one supposedly short of rifles, crosses over the Volga in daylight, which he didn't do, he crossed at night. Then Zaitsev is hoarded with the rest of the unarmed men towards a truck, to be either given a rifle or some bullets. As this happens, the officer or commissar, it's not clear which, shouts, the one with the rifle shoots, the one without follows him. When the one with the rifle gets killed, the one who is following picks up the rifle and shoots. Except the men either get a rifle or the bullets, they don't get both. So the one with the rifle can't shoot because he doesn't have any bullets. So yes, the film is that bad it even gets its own script wrong. Although it's possible they did this intentionally to make the Soviets look even worse. But, even overlooking this issue, is there any truth to the idea that there was one guy with a rifle and one guy with bullets? And is there any truth to the idea that 13th Guards Rifle Division went into combat without enough weapons? 
Well, Glantz says that at least 1,000 men of Rodintsev's division didn't have rifles. Probably getting this information from Chubikov, who thought that too. More than a thousand of Rodimsev's soldiers had no rifles. And in his book, Craig says that they were short 2,000 rifles, not 1,000. But is this really the case? True, the division reached the Volga area on the 13th of September without enough rifles, but as Isayev points out, the lack of rifles at this point was mainly in the rear services and artillery units, not the frontline rifle battalions, the units going into battle. The artillery units, except anti-tank, stayed on the east bank of the Volga. And that was just on the 13th of September. The report clearly states that the division was then armed on the east bank of the river on the 14th and 15th, before being sent across overnight on the 14th to the 15th. The division went in piecemeal, so not all units crossed over at the same time. Some didn't arrive until the evening of the 15th and 16th. Therefore, the soldiers actually had their full complement of rifles by the time they moved into the city of Stalingrad. Isayev does note that the division didn't have its full complement of heavy machine guns on the 13th of September. But again, they didn't throw their machine gunners at the enemy in unarmed waves. Instead, Yeremenka had ordered that the division replace a portion of its heavy machine guns with submachine guns, which were much more suited to the city fight. These were given to the troops by the 15th of September. Even Chuikov, straight after he mentions that they didn't have enough rifles, even Chuikov suggests that the men of the division got their weapons in time. The Front Military Council had instructed the Front Deputy Commander, Lieutenant General Golikov, to see to it that the weapons the division needed were delivered to the Krasnaya Sloboda area by the evening of September 14th. There was no guarantee, however, that they would arrive in time. I immediately ordered my deputy in charge of the army's rear, General Lobov, who was on the left bank of the Volga, to collect guns among the army's rear units and hand them over to the guardsmen. So, not only did Yeremenka give them enough rifles or submachine guns, but Chuikov may have given them even more. Therefore, it is wrong to think that the Red Army sent unarmed men into combat at Stalingrad. And if there were any shortages, they didn't order the men to charge at the enemy, one with a rifle and one without. To conclude, we'll end with this quote from Anton Jolly. A long-lasting myth is thus finally dispelled. By the way, if you haven't seen Anton Jolly's Susdal Camp series, which is about the fate of the German generals captured at Stalingrad, including Paulus, you really should. There's a reason why he's only got 19,000 subscribers, Yet, the first video in this series has 754,000 views. The reason why is because it's brilliant. So, I'll leave a link in the description and at the end of the video. Anyway, Chuikov ordered Rodimsev to ferry his division across the Volga, with two of his regiments to clear the centre of the city, and another to secure Mamiev Kurgan. Chuikov then asked Rodimsev how he felt about his orders. I am a communist. I have no intention of abandoning the city. This was good because the 62nd Army was on the brink. The Germans occupied the specialist buildings, the Gossbank, the brewery, the railway buildings, and the L-shaped house. A German sniper now killed the chief administrator at the landing stage, then got the commissar who replaced him. From the Gossbank, German machine guns compelled Petrakov's NKVD policemen and the border guards to keep their heads down, while the Germans used a Soviet 76.2mm gun that they just captured to fire at the ferries on the Volga. Yet, the Germans couldn't take the last few metres because the handful of Soviet troops counterattacked, retaking the 76.2mm gun. Petrakov's men then turned this gun against the Germans in the state bank, while other artillery and Katusha rockets from across the Volga blasted the Germans. Worse, despite deploying purple smoke to highlight their positions, their called-in Stuka support accidentally bombed their own positions. The Germans then noticed something. There was something in the darkness ahead of them and they began firing at it. It was 20 hundred hours, 
and five minesweepers appeared on the Volga. They carried 750 men of the 1st Battalion of 42nd Guards Rifle Regiment, 13th Guards Rifle Division, which had been reinforced by some other elements. It was the division's artillery that was blasting the Germans in the specialist buildings, helping out Petrakov's men. Colonel Yelin, commander of 42nd Guards Rifle Regiment, describes the crossing. The whole Volga was boiling from explosions. Here and there flashed bursts of tracer bullets. Soldiers were standing stoically. It was getting worse as the barges drew near the shore. German mortars and artillery rained down upon their craft. Then the boats hit the shore. The guards sprang into the water under a hail of enemy fire. With heavy casualties, they fought their way forward. A 76mm gun stood on the shore, men busy around it. They were NKVD troops. I thanked them for their support. First Battalion had landed. They charged up the steep sandy bank of the Volga and into the history books. The question is, could they do what was needed of them? Could they push the Germans back? Let's find out. Initially, Radimsev ordered 1st Battalion to retake the houses of specialists. However, after landing, Churikov himself bypassed the chain of command and told them to recapture the Central Railway Station instead, which he believed was the linchpin to his defences in this part of the city. So they pressed on towards the station. At about 2300 hours, they moved through Fallen Fighters Square, where they came under fire from a German machine gunner in a building near the Unimavag department store. After a brief fight, the battalion recaptured the store and the area around it. Chuikov also ordered a battalion of 11 KV tanks from 133rd Tank Brigade to reinforce the effort to recapture the station. As the KVs arrived, Stugs from the 244th Sturmgeschütz Battalion blocked their progress, and a stalemate ensued, with both sides taking vehicle losses. Then, just after midnight, as the 1st Battalion moved on towards the station, three KV tanks from the 133rd Tank Brigade went with them. The 1st Company of the 1st Battalion, commanded by Anton Kuzmich Dragon, were ordered to take the station. They pressed on through enemy fire, and when they were ready, they charged forwards, threw grenades, and fired their guns, taking the station and the freight cars on the tracks. They achieved their objective, but the Germans counterattacked, and the station changed hands several times over the next few hours in a swirling struggle. At the end of it, though, the Soviets managed to secure the station itself. The 1st Battalion now occupied the train station, portions of the nearby nail factory, the House of Communes, and had located its headquarters in the department store knowing its mission was complete. A quick note, it is claimed that 1st Battalion's commander was wounded at some point in this action and was replaced by his deputy, Senior Lieutenant Fedesiev. But, according to 1st Company's commander, Dragon, whose account sounds a lot more realistic than some of the others, that's not what happened. Therefore, Cherviakov stayed in command for now. The 2nd Battalion of the 42nd Regiment also crossed over the Volga at 0100 hours on the 15th of September. They landed north of the Houses of Specialists and secured the brewery and the NKVD complex. The Germans intensified their firing and bombing. The soldiers that had been put ashore threw themselves into hand-to-hand -hand combat from the march in the area of the residence buildings of the Specialists and brewery. Commanders and political workers inspired us to do battle, and we knew that there was no ground for us across the Volga. Everything around us was in flames. We occupied a small strip of shoreline, and the fascists figured that, with a modest effort, they could sweep us away and destroy us. But the enemy did not take into account the Soviet soldiers' patriotism and will to victory. Outflanking the state bank, the 2nd Battalion moved towards the train station, but was stopped by a German machine gunner in a school. Two battalions of the 34th Guards Rifle Regiment also started to land further north in the area of the two ravines. One of their ships sank with the loss of 12 men, and the pilot of another refused to drive his boat to the shore. So he was shot. They did manage to land, though, under fire from 1st Battalion of the 518th Infantry Regiment, which held several buildings on the riverbank. 
An artillery observer recalled what happened. At approximately 0300, our command and control platoon, scouts and signalers, were crossed over to Stalingrad on a cutter together with rifle subunits. When approximately 50 meters remained to the bank, our cutter came under enemy fire, received holes in its hull, and began to sink. There were about 100 men on the cutter. Around 30, including myself, reached the bank. We came up in the area of an oil tank. The entire city was engulfed in fire. Barges with oil were burning on the river. The first thing I saw on the bank was the corpses of our soldiers. Using the ravines as cover, the 1st and 2nd Battalions of 34th Regiment managed to outflank the Germans. Then the 2nd Battalion used smoke to get close before recapturing these buildings from the enemy. The 1st Battalion, meanwhile, had moved along the ravine and reached the railway. More elements of 13th Guards Rifle Division crossed the Volga to reinforce this bridgehead, but this time they crossed in broad daylight. In subsequent Soviet histories of the battle, the events of 14th September were rearranged to show that all the guardsmen crossed the Volga at night. The mass panic, which forced Chuikov and Rodimsev to throw their troops into battle in broad daylight, was too painful to acknowledge. The mere possibility of military failure at Stalingrad besmirched the honour of the communist state. But, besmirch it or not, this is what happened. In the afternoon, under cover of a smoke screen, elements of 3rd Battalion, 42nd Guards Rifle Regiment, which a certain Sergeant Pavlov belonged to, landed near the 2nd Battalion. Radimsev and his headquarters also landed nearby, after his boat was hit by a shell, killing many of those around him. He survived, though, and made it to the shore. There are accounts of several more boats being hit and destroyed in the process of this daylight crossing, so this was a terrible waste of life. Once on the bank, though, the elements of 3rd Battalion also moved towards the railway line, but were again stopped by German fire. Shortly afterwards, an artilleryman from 13th Guards Rifle Division set up an observation post in Grudinin's steel mill. He says that they could see the 9th of January square, but only through a periscope because German snipers had begun hunting them. Throughout the rest of the day, 71st Infantry Division attempted to attack in the city centre, and went nowhere. The 194th Regiment battled with 13th Guards Rifle Division for railway station number 1 and the nearby areas. The 211th and 191st Regiments did take some ground along the northern bank of the Tsaritsa River, although not much. And by this point, Wooster had made his way from his bathhouse and entered a school building close enough to the river that he could see it. He ordered his battery to shell Soviet anti-aircraft positions located on the island near Krasnaya Sloboda, which they dutifully did. So yes, 13th Guards Rifle Division had landed, and by the end of the 15th of September, the Germans had largely been pushed back from the bank of the Volga in most areas. Only the Goss Bank and the Houses of Specialists remained in their hands. The timely arrival of Varimsev's 13th Guards Rifle Division ensured that Churikov could continue to conduct a viable defence in the city at a time when it appeared his army would simply erode away and collapse outright. It also began a process that would continue throughout September and October, and at the most critical times, feed fresh flesh and blood into the Stalingrad meat grinder. Interestingly, 6th Army's diary states that, in the morning, units of 71st Infantry Division repelled an attempt to cross the Volga. However, the crossing in Square 45 continues to operate. Square 45 is the area where 1st Battalion of the 42nd Guards Rifle Regiment had landed, but I'm not sure which landing was supposedly repelled by 71st Infantry Division, so 6th Army's diary is clearly incorrect. The landing had been successful. Still, even with the 13th Guards Rifle Division reaching the city, the Soviets weren't out of the woods yet. Paulus had planned to launch a dawn assault on the 15th of September, due to start at 03.30 hours. Zeilitz's 51st Army Corps, with the 295th Infantry Division specifically, would strike towards the heights west of the Red October Workers' Village, as well as against Mamiev Kurgan. At the same time, Kemp's 48th Panzer Corps would drive towards the Tsaritsa Balka. 
If this southern attack succeeded, then 24th Panzer Division might be able to link up with the 71st Infantry Division and surround Churikov's forces, and perhaps Churikov himself. At the very least, these attacks should decrease the pressure on 71st Infantry Division in the centre of the city. So, at dawn on the 15th of September, Paulus's assault began. Several accounts describe the intense air, artillery and rocket bombardment that hits both the Soviet formations and the ferry crossings on the Volga. Then, 516th and 517th Regiments of Wutmann's 295th Infantry Division advanced eastwards towards the heights above the Red October village. They engaged Krichman's 6th Guards Tank and Bermakov's 38th Motorized Rifle Brigades and the remnants of the 9th Motorized Rifle Brigade. The 518th Infantry Regiments fought on the slopes of Mamiev Kurgan, with several Soviet units resisting them. And to the south, the main attack of the day began at 0300 hours, with 48th Panzer Corps, 24th Panzer and 94th Infantry Divisions pushing eastwards. Slightly later, at 0330 hours, 29th Motorized Division also advanced as well. So, clearly, Churikov and his men had survived one attack. But would they survive the next? If they didn't stop this new attack, potentially the whole of the southern and central parts of Stalingrad could be overrun by the Germans, and the city might fall. They had to hold on. The battle raged in the streets of Stalingrad, but one of the key parts of this battlefield wasn't in the urban areas. It was Mamayev Kurgan the Tartar burial mound which dominated the centre of the city. Whoever held this hill would have a massive advantage over the enemy in the central and southern parts of the city. So it was vital for the Germans to take it, and equally critical that the Soviets hold it. This is why, around this time, the fighting here became a confused mess, with attacks and counterattacks happening over and over again. It was so bad that the sources don't entirely match up with each other, causing a bit of a debate about how things proceeded. Looking at all the reports, what is definitely certain is that Mamayev Kurgan was taken by the Germans in the morning of the 15th, after a devastating artillery and air bombardment. And they seem to have overrun elements of 112 rifle divisions, some of whom fled the battlefield, including a Soviet gun battery. To be fair, they were dying of thirst, had nothing to eat but the meat cut from dead horses, and had received no supplies of any kind, so we can't be too harsh on them. But flee they did, even though there was nowhere to run to, except the Volga, where the NKVD were waiting. From 13th through 15th September, the blocking detachment of 62nd Army Special Department detained 1,218 men. Of these, 21 were shot, 10 were arrested, and the rest were sent to their units. The majority of those detained came from 10th NKVD Division and the Associated Regiment of 399th Rifle Division, which was abandoned on the battlefield by the regiment's commander and commissar. It's somewhat amusing that, instead of soldiers, one with a rifle and the other without, charging the enemy in waves, only to fall back and then be gunned down by the NKVD as betrayed in Enemy at the Gates, the soldiers mostly stood their ground. It was the NKVD themselves that fell back, were picked up, not shot for the most part, and were forced to go back to their units. Yes, the reality is more interesting than the myth. Also, it seems that the soldiers weren't the ones who fled, but the officers. For displaying cowardice, fleeing from the field of battle and abandoning units to the mercy of their fate, the commander of the Associated Regiments of 399th Rifle Division, Major Zhukov, and the Commissar, Senior Politruck Raspopov, have been shot in front of the ranks. This is exactly what we said about Order No. 227 earlier in the series. Rather than the men being shot, it was the officers who were in trouble. Yes, some of the men got shot too, but the majority were in fact sent back to their units. Order 227 was primarily intended to be used as a middle management technique against the officers, not the men, and here is a good example of that. So, Mamayev Kurgan fell to the Germans in the morning. That part everyone is in agreement with. Now this is where things get confusing, and the confusion comes from two reports. The first is from the 112th Rifle Division, which claims 
that the 39th Guards Rifle Regiment arrived and then together they retook the hill in the early afternoon. This is partly backed up by the 6th Army's diary which says an interim report indicated that they had lost the hill again. The issue is that every other source I have, including the accounts of one of the guardsmen, Chuikov and Yeremenka, indicate that the 39th Guards Rifle Regiment didn't land in Stalingrad until the evening of the 15th and didn't arrive in the Mamayev Kurgan area until the morning of the next day, the 16th. It was my own regiment, the 39th, which crossed the Volga 24 hours later, during the night of 15th September, and took up positions close to the Mamayev Kurgan, ready for an attack the following morning. And Yeremenka himself says, After the enemy captured the Mamayev Kurgan, the situation in the city got harder and harder for us. There was no reserves, and the central crossing of the Volga was under threat. So, there was no reserves at this point, and Churikov says that he ordered the 39th Regiment to be ferried across the Volga and sent to Mamiev Kurgan. Yes, he says the wrong regiment number, it wasn't the 42nd, but the point is that the 39th wasn't at the hill on the 15th. The 112th Rifle Division's report most likely got the days mixed up, and in the 6th Army's diary, it does say that the Germans retained the hill after beating back stubborn enemy counterattacks. So, the interim report was probably added because the hill was being contested. This is further supported by the fact that Mamiev Kurgan remained occupied by the Germans at the end of the day, which suggests that the hill wasn't retaken on this day. So, until better sources clarify the situation in the future, we're going to stick to this version of events for now. As the fighting on Mamiev Kurgan raged, the brawl also continued throughout the day in the centre of the city. And it was noted that 13th Guards Rifle Division was, by now, running out of ammunition. The division's soldiers employed their weapons poorly, and the division reached its positions in Stalingrad without ammunition. The division undertook measures to obtain ammunition. Later in the report it says, During combat on 15 September, 13th Guards Rifle Division lost 400 men killed and wounded and expended all of the ammunition for its automatic weapons. Note, the division had ammunition when they landed, but due to poor logistics, ran low on ammunition. It seems a stretch to say that they exhausted all their ammunition in a day, and the fighting raged on, suggesting that they didn't run out completely. They were also trying to get more ammunition, so again, this doesn't suggest that they sent their soldiers into battle, one with a rifle, one without. Also, there's this interesting part of the report. During the battle for the NKVD building on 15 September, a woman calling herself Volodina who spoke the German language and was actively taking part in combat as an automatic weapons man on the German side, was taken prisoner. Because she was wounded, the situation did not permit interrogation, and our worker shot Volodina. This is the NKVD complex where Volodina fought, in the city centre close to the Volga. It does raise the question though, if Volodina had been recruited by the Germans to fight on their side, did they also employ other non-Germans within their divisions to fight for them as well? We know they employed Hiwis for non-combat roles, like carrying ammunition and wounded, plus other heavy labour duties, but did they employ some of them for combat roles as well? If they employed some trusted prisoners of war as part of their units, it could help explain why their combat units had more punch despite being low on German soldiers. And obviously, the Soviet fighters would be relied upon more than the Germans, leading to higher casualties for them, and less for the Germans. Is this what happened, or is this just a one-off? Interestingly, the Germans claim that 71st Infantry Division only lost 16 men killed and 50 wounded on this day. So if this is true, then the main thing they lost was ground, not men, which could support the idea that it wasn't German soldiers getting killed, but their helpers that they'd recruited to fight for them. This is, of course, speculation, but it's something to consider. The main attack of the day, though, was in the south. At 0300 hours, 48th Panzer Corps, 24th Panzer, and 94th Infantry Divisions pushed eastwards. Slightly later, 29th Motorized Division advanced as well. 
After an initial close combat fight, 24th Panzer Division overwhelmed 10th Rifle Brigade's defences on the railway line, forcing it back. This opened up the tracks ahead of them. In the leather factory area, 4th Motorcycle Battalion gained ground near the barracks, fighting against the 244th Rifle Division. Kampf Group Hellermann pushed into the suburbs against elements of 10th Rifle Brigade as well as 244th Rifle Division. But it was Kampf Group Edelsheim which made the most gains. Edelsheim struck along the railway line towards the Maximovsky Detour north of the Elshanka River. They reached the area before the detour by 1400 hours, which is where their attack bogged down. As a further assault came to a standstill as a result of shortages in assault forces, the panzers were employed as support in local combat. Brave Russian infantrymen holding out in foxholes both sides of the tracks defended themselves bitterly, but most of them, faced with being crushed or blasted by the panzers, gave themselves up. There was also flanking fire coming from the blast furnace buildings to the south, which stalled the attack. But two regiments from the 94th Infantry Division were now moving through Minina and would soon potentially clear Soviet forces from the area. The 276th Infantry Regiment and Fremery's 29th Motorized Division, with some tanks borrowed from 14th Panzer Division, attacked to the south of the Yelshanka Balka. Soviet guardsmen fell back to the lumber mill or along the railway line, and the bridge nearest the Volga was taken by 129th Panzer Battalion early in the morning. Dubiansky's men counterattacked twice near the railroad, but were beaten off with the help of Stuka support, allowing the Germans to consolidate their positions across the Balka. At 13.45 hours, the Panzer crews watched in disbelief as a Soviet plane rammed a Ju-88 and sent it crashing to the ground not far away. This event is confirmed by Bergstrom, and there was a second ramming incident on this day too, with Kapitan Tenikov managing to down a Bf-110 with his LA-5. These were the only kills that the Soviets got in the air on this day, losing 30 of their own aircraft in the process. It's not wrong to say that the Germans dominated the skies at this time. 29th Motorized Division advanced again in the afternoon, moving northwards towards the power station. One of the German Panzer III's was hit by an anti-tank round from a Soviet 7.62cm gun, killing four of the five crew members. The last casualties that 129th Panzer Battalion would suffer in Stalingrad. The motorcycle battalion advanced to the railway line south of the power station, while the Panzers and 15th Motorized Regiment moved between it and the Volga, reaching the area just south of Nizhny Yelshanka. By this point, Dubiansky's 35th Guards Rifle Division, the bulk of Pashoshin's 131st Rifle Division, elements of 271st NKVD Rifle Regiment, and 133rd Tank Brigade, were devastated. They had all fallen back into the Nizhny Yelshanka area in a disorganized mess. 62nd Army reports that these forces lost up to 75 to 80 percent of their personnel during this fight, meaning that there was little left to stop the Germans in the south. So the attack continued. 94th Infantry and 24th Panzer Divisions jointly used their artillery to suppress enemy fire coming from the buildings on the southern bank of the Elshanka River. This allowed 24th Panzer Division's Grenadiers to move through the first set of buildings north of the railway line, fighting Soviet infantry as they did. A Soviet machine gun fired away, protecting the bridge over the next Balka, but the bridge quickly fell to an infantry assault. A Soviet armoured train was spotted ahead, and Stukas were called in to sort it out. But the Stukas also bombed Kampf Group Edelsheim, as the men sent frantic radio messages for them to stop. Recovering their composure, the Grenadiers pushed forwards into the warehouses and buildings of the Maximovsky Detour, covering the flanks of the advancing Panzers. The buildings were quickly taken, with Kampf Group Edelsheim turning northwards, their left flank moving into the residential houses to clear them of Soviet resistance. Red Army riflemen in these streets slowly gave ground, and it wasn't until 1600 hours that Edelsheim finally managed to capture the southern railway station. Pausing for a moment under the gaze of the massive grain elevator, 
they wondered why the Soviets didn't defend it. Yet, for some reason, they also didn't send anyone to secure it themselves. The reason appears to be that their infantry were in the residential areas, and so there wasn't enough to be sent to the elevator. But even so, this was probably a mistake. Here we can see a photo of Panzer 525 and some infantry in the southern train station. The men are resting and don't appear to be in any danger, even though, quite clearly, they can see the grain elevator in the background, suggesting that the elevator was free of Soviet troops at this point. What's also interesting is that instead of heading towards the cannery and the water pumping station, a shorter move which could have cut off Soviet forces to the south, Edelsheim received orders to move towards the Tsaritsa Balka. Again, the lack of infantry seems to have influenced this decision, as did the aim of reaching 71st Infantry Division and potentially surrounding Soviet units to the west. Therefore, Edelsheim left a small guard to defend the train station and struck further northwards along the railway. Soviet forces disintegrated ahead of him, allowing the panzers to make rapid progress and reach the southern bank of the Tsaritsa Balka at 16.15 hours, just 15 minutes after setting off. They then moved west into the streets and buildings of the Dargora district, north of the hospital. Unfortunately, 71st Infantry Division mistakenly believed that the panzers were incoming Soviet tanks, and knocked three of them out. This, and the fact that the light was fading, was probably what prompted Edelsheim to pull his panzers back to the railway station, where they huddled for the evening. At about this time, 274th Infantry Regiment seized the railway bridge across the Yelshanka River, allowing Pfeiffer's infantry to link up with Lenski's Panzer Grenadiers. And, zooming out slightly, it's clear that 24th Panzer Division's advance had been largely successful, and had almost reached 71st Infantry Division's lines. Had 71st Infantry Division been able to advance at all, there's no doubt that they would have linked up with Lenski's panzers and completed the encirclement of Soviet forces to the west. This obviously hadn't happened, mainly due to the 13th Guards Rifle Division's landings and the perseverance of ad hoc forces around Chirikov's headquarters. Probably because of this advance and the capture of Mamayev Kurgan, in his first diary entry since the 9th of September, the first since he was told by Keitel that his job was on the line, and the first since the Vinitsa conference, Halder said, Gratifying advances in Stalingrad. Yes, even at this stage, Halder was happy with the situation in Stalingrad, going against his own narrative after the war. He was somewhat right, though, at this moment. The 24th Panzer Division's successful advance had come at the price of only a handful of panzers. After repairs, they were five down from the day before, bringing their current total to 23, seven of them Panzer IIs. They also took 90 casualties this day, although some were only wounded and would stay with the troops. The 94th Infantry lost 36 men killed and 37 wounded, with the 29th motorized losing 37 killed, 100 wounded, and 2 missing as well. Even though they hadn't completed the encirclement, 244th Rifle Division and the other units to the west were now more or less cut off. As confirmation of this fact, Afanasyev told his superiors that his division hadn't received food or ammunition for several days, even before the encirclement which is further evidence that the 62nd Army was failing to supply itself by boat across the Volga. Worse, the 24th Panzer Division's breakthrough resulted in the Germans getting into the rear of the 244th Rifle Division's units and cutting them off from the formation's rear establishment and headquarters. This led to a loss of troop control, while only scouts could get into the regiment lines at night. But the small number of infantry in 24th Panzer and 94th Infantry Divisions had made it impossible for German forces to clear or occupy all the important buildings in southern Stalingrad, including the elevator. This meant that pockets of Red Army riflemen and guardsmen still occupied and even reoccupied buildings that the Germans had thought they'd cleared. One group was in the lumber mill, another in the power station, and more in other buildings in the Minina and Yelshanka areas. Thus, as they set out to accomplish their new missions in the morning of the 16th, 
Lenski's Panzergrenadiers, Pfeiffer's Infantry and Fremery's Panzergrenadiers would face renewed opposition to their front, flanks and rear as Soviet soldiers rose Phoenix-like from seemingly liberated city blocks and buildings. This would significantly slow the pace of Kemp's advance. At 1810 hours, the OKH informed 4th Panzer Army that Kemp's 48th Panzer Corps would be subordinated to Powers' 6th Army at midnight, as agreed at the Vinitsa Conference on the 12th of September. Lenski then received new orders at 2050 hours. 24th Panzer Division was to advance west of the railway line up to the Tsaritsa Gully and form a bridgehead there, where they could meet up with the 71st Infantry Division. The priority was to destroy Soviet forces in the western part of Stalingrad. But could they do this? Well, the German command certainly had their doubts. The battle for Stalingrad Fortress is distinguished by the enemy's exceptional obstinacy and bitterness. So, we'll have to see if they can do what was required next time. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.